kind of glass tube was pointing at Matson's body. When the switch went in, there was a whining noise. And then a white light shot out of it. I know you won't believe this. When it hit the body, it, it went all soft. It, it was just like the bones had gone out of it. It just went all soft and kind of poured off the chair and onto the floor. Midnight. The witching hour when the night is darkest. Our fears the strongest. And our strength at its lowest ebb. Midnight. When the graves gape open and death strikes. How? You'll learn the answer in just a minute in... The Heavy Death. And now, Murder at Midnight. Tales of Mystery and Terror by Radio's Masters of the Macabre. Our story, written by Robert Newman, is a weird and fantastic nightmare called The Heavy Death. A road just outside the small town of Medford. And running up at his face, white and terror-stricken in the moonlight, is a small, slight man. He pauses every once in a while, his breath whistling in his nostrils, listening, and then runs on again. Finally, seeing the two green lights of the state police barracks, he moans oh. with relief. Runs in. Oh, thank God there's somebody here. I was afraid. Look, officer, you got to get me away from here fast. Huh? Yeah, just a minute, Mac. Take it easy. Not easy. You'll be here any minute. Come and ask me. i got to get away, I tell you. And I'm I... telling you to take it easy. Just wait till I get through talking to Dr. Carden Dr. here. Dr. Carden? I'll... Are you the Dr. Carden lives in the big white house near the river? Why, yes. Well, then you can tell him it's true. Otherwise, he won't believe me. Nobody will. It was you who swiped the big glass thing from, from your laboratory. A and... Geiger counter? You stole it? Well, he made me do it. Oh, now, whoa. This is getting interesting. That's why Dr. Carden's here. You know anything about his assistant? Young chap named Matson? Yeah. He's dead. He killed him. Matson? Matson dead? And maybe you better start from the beginning. Tell us the whole story. Yeah, but I didn't even right time. He'd be coming after me and... Oh, okay. Like I said, you won't believe it. My name's Sullivan. They call me Shell because I'm a come on with Brian's giant carnival. Weight guessing is my racket, but I turn my hand at almost anything, you know, Shell game, three card, Marty. Well, we hit town about, about ten days ago for a three-day stand. The first two nights was pretty quiet. The third one was when it happened. There was a pretty fair crowd around, and I was warming him up for some weight guessing. With maybe some side bets. When he came up. Okay, folks, okay. Step up, step up, hurry up. And let's hope Miss Sullivan this your weight. A cupid doll has been three pounds off either way. Now, what do you say, lady? Your weight's not like your age, you know. Ha, <laughs> ha, it always shows. <laughs> what about you, sir? Guess your weight? Do you really think you can? Do I think? Ha, <laughs> ha, listen to him, folks. You bet your sweet life, brother. Oh, I have already. The question is, will you bet your sweet life? What? What do you mean? Look, do you want me to guess your weight or not, huh? On the terms I outlined, why, yes. I'll be glad to have you try. Try, try, says he. Okay, folks, here we go. Now, let's see. Mm-hmm. A big man, a solid man. Hefty pair of arms on him. I say, uh, 195 pounds. 195. And three pounds off either way, and you get a cupid doll. Now, just sit right down here in the scale. There you are. Hey. Hey, what goes on here? You broke my scale. Yes, it only goes up to 350 pounds. 300? What do you got in your pockets? Would you like to look? Nah. No, I don't know how you did it, but more power to you, brother. When I lose, that pay with a smile. Well, here's your QB. Thank you. No, that's not what we bet. What? What do you mean? I think you know what I mean. The carnival closes in about an hour. I'll be waiting. walking off slow and heavy. The crowd stood around for a couple of minutes gaping at the broken scale and talking. Then they all decided it was some kind of a gag and went on and forgot about it. For me, I couldn't forget about it. Somehow I didn't think it was a gag. There was something about him. The way he moved, the way he talked, it scared the pants off me. I hung around for a while getting my stuff together and then I looked up Rube Thomas. Rube's a big guy. He used to be a wrestler and he was just closing up his wheel of fortune. Hiya, Rube. How are they going? Uh, not bad for a one-horse town. How's it you? Oh, not too bad. Well, some wise guy busted my scale. Huh? Busted your scale? Yeah. Um, well, Rube, that's why I come over. He was a queer duck. I 
just couldn't figure his pitch, but he, he said something about waiting for me when he closed up, so I thought... So, could... so you thought maybe you should have some protection walking out of the station. Yeah. <laughs> That's a hot one. What is? Yeah, on your side beds. Well, don't worry about it. Ain't no one gonna lay a finger on you when you're with Rube Thomas. I helped Rube take down the wheel. But even then, we were about the last to leave the fairgrounds. We went out through the main gate. It was pretty dark, but I wasn't worried anymore. I'd never yet seen anybody Rube couldn't handle. Then I heard footsteps. Slow and heavy ones. And then... There you are. And I've been waiting for you. Yeah? No kidding? Just the guy? Yeah. Okay, Bob. What's the pitch? What's your racket? Racket? There's no racket. Your friend and I had a bet. I've come to collect. Yeah? Well, I'll tell you a funny thing about carnivals. When we pull up stakes and get ready to go, all bets are off. I'm afraid this one can't be called off. You see, I need him. You need him? Yes. You bet your life, remember? And you lost. You mean you... Oh, you're nuts. Uh, people who have thought so, but I'm not. Shall we go? No. No, I ain't gonna... Rube! Take it easy, Shell. I told you all bets was off, mister. Now you're gonna blow him, I'm gonna have to get rough with you. I wouldn't if I were you. No? Well, here's one just for luck. Oh, no, my hand. I warned you. Oh, you. I'll break your bloody neck. I'm sorry, I didn't want to hurt you. You won't believe this. Like, you probably won't believe what happened afterwards. He didn't swing or anything. He just kind of... Dropped his fist on Rube's head. And he smashed in his skull like it hit him with a lead pipe. Good logic. You killed him. Yes. Shall we go? No, no, I... Look at me. Into my eyes. That's right. Now remember this. You're mine. Mine to do it exactly as I wish. And you do exactly what I wish. Do you understand? Yes, yes, yes. Good. Then let's go. Something happened. Happened to me then and there. Something I ain't over yet. It wasn't just that I was scared, more scared than I've ever been in my life. It was something else. When I looked into his eyes, it was like I just plain didn't count. That no one or nothing did. Then I just had to do whatever he wanted, whatever he said. We got in his car and drove to his to your place, Doc, and we stopped in front of it and he pointed at a kind of low building behind it. That is Dr. Carden's laboratory. And he has something there I need. A Geiger counter. You're going in and get it for me. You mean swipe it? Yes. It would take too much time to make one of my own. And as I said, I need it. Now, it's a long glass tube about this size with filaments inside yeah, it. Yeah, but suppose somebody sees me. Suppose somebody comes... Carden's away in Washington with that childish atomic energy condition of theirs. There's only Matts and his assistant, and he must be sleeping. If he should try and stop you... Well, you'll have to take care of him, but remember, I want that Geiger counter. Like I said, it was like I was numb. Didn't have a mind of my own. I did it. Found an open window. Went in and got what he wanted. Brought it out to him. He didn't say a word. He just put it in the back of the car and we drove away. It was about a quarter of twelve when we got to his place. A big rambling house at the foot of a mountain. He took me around the back to a kind of iron door and... Well, it was, it was like out of Buck Rogers, the 25th century. Big glass tubes, dynamos, wires. He must have noticed me staring because he said... Go ahead, look around. There's equipment here that doesn't exist any place else in the world. Yeah, but what's it all for? And if I told you, you'd be even more frightened than you are now. By the way, what's your name? Sullivan. Shell Sullivan. I'm Dr. Vance. Dr. Brian Vance. Doctor? Of nuclear physics. Without doubt, the greatest scientist in the world today. Do you know anyone else who has been able to convert most of the elements of the human body into the heavy isotopes? Uh, look, I don't know what you mean, but is that... Yes. That is why not only my weight, but the entire atomic mass of my body... What's that? Sounds like a car. Yes, but Coop. Oh, Matson. Must have heard you in the laboratory. Followed us. Well, I was as quiet as I could be honest. Uh, there's nothing to be worried or excited about. Hello, Matson. Vance. I should have known it was you. Should have known what with me? A stole our Geiger. You did an awful lot of strange things in your career, Vance, but this time you've gone just a little too far. This time I've got you dead to rights. I'm afraid it's just the other way around, Matson. What do you mean? What? Vance. 
You don't really think I'd let you or anyone interfere with what I'm doing, do you? You you killed him, you... Of course. Drag him over there out of the way. There's a certain experiment I'm just about ready to try, and his body will come in very handy. With Jill Sullivan staring at him in abject horror... Dr. Vance turns away from the body on the floor, lumbers over to one of his instruments, and begins examining it. And far away, in the town's church steeple, the clock strikes twelve for... Murder at midnight. Back to Murder at Midnight and The Heavy Death. It's just a moment later. Sergeant Rowe and Dr. Carden are staring incredulously at Sullivan as he pauses for a moment in his terrifying story. And the trooper says, We did find Thomas's body out by the fairground, but it was an accident. Hit by a truck or something. You mean this Vance killed Madsen just like that? Shot him without turning a hair. Uh, sure sounds to me like... Dr. Carden, what do you think? I don't know, Sergeant. I do know Vance. I knew that he had a laboratory somewhere near here. and Well, it's true that he probably knows as much about nuclear physics as anyone in the world. We tried several times to get him to work with us during the war, but he laughed at us, said that what we were doing was childish. Yes, but, but, but this other business is changing himself, making himself heavy. Yeah, even his voice was heavy-like. Is that possible, Doctor? Theoretically, yes, I suppose it is. After all, Professor Yuri did it with hydrogen, made heavy water. And we've done it with uranium. Yes, but why would he want to do it? Why? There I can only guess. For all his genius, I've always felt Vance was a little mad. It's possible he believes that by changing the atomic weight of his body, he can make it immune to disease. Yeah, that's right. It's true. He said he was going to live forever. Uh, well, go on, Sullivan. What happened after that? <laughs> He made me help him do things around the laboratory. Wire and stuff like that. Seems he got tired pretty easy and his hands was too heavy to do work that was delicate-like. Maybe that's why he needed someone else around. Finally, I couldn't keep my eyes open anymore and I fell asleep on a cot in a corner. I don't know if he ever slept or not. If he did, I never seen him. When I woke up, it was around noon and he had Matson's body propped up in a chair against a... just a kind of a silver screen. Will you finally get up, eh, Sullivan? I was just going to wake you. Uh, yes, sir. I... I'm kind of hungry, sir. Oh, yes, food. Well, you're going to help me with a little experiment first, and then we can eat. Yes, sir. Uh, what kind of experiment? Well, you... You mean... Why, yes. An experiment on our friend Matson's body. And he won't mind. Just a little calcium transmutation. First, we switch on our alpha generator here. Then we make a few frequency adjustments... What? What are you going to do? You'll see. Over there, stand by that master switch on the converter. When I give the word... Yes, sir. They let it climb just a little higher. A little higher. Now! Oh! Oh, good Lord. No! No! There's a kind of glass tube pointing at Madsen's body. When I threw the switch, a white light shot out of it. And... I know you won't believe this. When it hit the body, it went all soft. It was like the bones had gone out of it. It just went all soft and kind of poured off the chair out of the floor. I must have faded or something when I come to. Vance was standing over me, smiling. Anything the matter, Sullivan? Don't you feel well? Uh, yes, sir. I, I'm all right. I mean, just a... That was the most awful, most terrible thing. Sullivan, if you were a soldier and you saw that happen to the man next to you, would you feel much like fighting after that? What? You, you mean you're going to do that? I'd that... advise you not to ask too many questions. We'll dispose of the rest of the body later, but now let's eat. Like I said, it was just about a week ago. I can't really tell you what happened after that because I was in a daze most of the time. We worked, him showing me what to do, wire and solder and stuff. 
we ate. Sometimes he let me sleep. Then this morning it happened. I woke up at about ten. He was standing looking at this thing we've been making. Well, Sullivan, it's finished. Just a few adjustments and we were ready to go. Yes, sir. And I'm profoundly grateful to you for your help. I will show you how grateful in a very concrete fashion. Hey, you mean you... You're going to let me go? You're going to let me go? Go? Really, Sullivan? That's a little foolish, isn't it? Well, I don't know. I just thought... Yeah, I... I guess it is. Well... Where are you going? Uh, inside to fix some breakfast. No, Sullivan. No food. No food? No. Because tonight you're going to enjoy a tremendous experience. One I experienced myself several months ago. And the process is much simpler when the stomach is empty. Process? You... You mean you... You're going to make me like you? Heavy? Yes, Sullivan. I told you I was grateful to you and... Oh, no, Doc. No, please, will you? For heaven's sake, You're being rather childish. I'm not going to bother detailing what it will mean to you physiologically. The immunities it will give you. I will merely tell you that we'll do it tonight. Getting changed to become like he was. Heavy as lead. Well, it did something to me. It was like I'd been dope, hypnotized. All that time, afraid to do anything to make him mad. Now, now I was even more scared to stay. I made out like everything was fine, and I waited. I waited and watched. Then about an hour ago, I got my chance. He went into the house to get something. He didn't lock the door. I was out like a shot, grabbed his car, and started down the driveway. As I went past the house, I heard a window open. Sullivan, come back! Come back! You'll regret this! You'll regret it! That's a story. I was so jittery, I went to a ditch just outside of town and had to run the west of the way. I don't care whether you believe me or not, whether you think I'm nuts, what you do to me. I just want one thing. Get me away from here. Get me far away fast. Because he's going to be coming after me. I know it. Well, I'm not saying what I think. Not yet. What about you, Dr. Carden? I, uh, I wouldn't like to say either. Knowing Vance, I believe he's capable of everything Sullivan told us. And theoretically, everything he described is No, I told you, I don't care whether you believe me or not. Just get me away from here. I can't for an hour or so. I have to call Bridgeton, have them send down some men. And we can really go into this. In the meantime, I'll... I'll put you in one of the detention cells. You'll be okay there. Are they strong? Really strong? Plenty strong enough to keep you in and anyone else out. Come on. <laughs> Can't you hear me? Sergeant! Dr. Cotton! Oh. Oh, gee, Sarge. I was starting to get a little worried. I was a... You. Yes, Sullivan. You didn't really think you were going to get away, did you? Oh. What are you going to do? You can't do anything. The cell door is locked. And if it... Let's see. There, you see... You can't break it down. You can't. It's steel. Oh. Yes, Sullivan. But steel can be smashed if it has to be. No. I told you you'd regret running away, didn't I? No, no. no, no. I'll look, I'll come back. I'll do anything you want. I'll... I'm afraid it's too late, Sullivan. No. Too late for anything but this. Dr. Carton. Huh? Did you hear it too? I'm not sure. But it did sound like... This way, quick. Good Lord. Look at that cell door. Oh, and Sullivan. His, his skull. Smashed like an eggshell. Well, Sergeant? I guess I must be nuts, too. Or else... Look, Doc. He must have just left here. If we wait for the men from Bridson, give him time enough to get back to his place to those blasted ray things of his, there's no telling what he'll do, how many lives he'll cost. But if we leave right now, the two of us, maybe we can get there before him. Cut him off. What do you say? You game? I'm game, Sergeant. Let's go. Yeah. That must be it. Right ahead. The laboratory's probably around and back. Well, Sergeant, the lights are on. Yeah. Maybe he left them on when he came into town and got Sullivan. Or maybe... No. No, listen. He's back. We're too late. What in heaven's name is that? An electrostatic generator or a cyclotron. He's... Oh, good Lord. 
up the mountain there. Look. Great Scott. Looks like a hole or something. But it's moving. A neutron beam. Disintegrating. Eating its way into the mountain. He must have found some way of harnessing... Dr. Garden, swinging his way. Must have seen us. Come on, run. No good, Sergeant. Seems to have a range of almost half a mile. But, but eating through solid rock that way. If it hits us... You came to see just what Vance was doing, eh, Garden? <laughs> well, take a good look. The last one you'll ever take at anything. Well, you shall be the first and to... did you think that you were going to get away with it, Vance? What? Who's that? Take a look at the guy. Gentlemen, it's too much. I've got to cut that down. And what'll happen when you release the load? But I've got to cut it down. Besides, you're, you're dead, Sullivan. Yeah, that's because I'm dead that you'll join me. You can't do it alone. Yes. Too heavy. But I, I've got too to slow. Time's any higher. Too hard. I, the generator. I've got to cut that down, too. <laughs> Dr. Garden. Dr. Garden. Where are you? Over. Over here, Sergeant. Are you all right? Uh, a little shaken up, but yes, I'm all right. Oh, the laboratory. A whole house. Look. Yes. What happened? Something. Something got out of control. Too much centrifugal force or, or the load released too suddenly and the whole thing exploded. Now there are things that we'll never know. Except something we knew already. That science can either be man's servant or his master and his doom. And as I stand there, gazing at the smoking ruin that were once Vance's laboratory, through the blessed silence comes the distant clang of the clock in the town's church steeple for the second time, striking 12 for... Murder at midnight. to be with us again when death hovers like a dark cloud and the clocks strike twelve for murder at midnight. The part of Shield Sullivan was played by Frank Reddick. With music by Charles Paul, Murder at Midnight was directed by Anton M. Leader.